Thank you. All right, so we'll call the meeting to order. Um, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, folks. In accordance with the open meeting law, the board states for the record that this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and may be recorded by other local media. And welcome everyone. We're happy to see a, a full room here for our two individuals that we're recognizing tonight. And so our first order of business is to actually, well, let's skip the, the minutes and go right into the recognitions, all right? Um, is to recognize our North Reading Community Volunteer, Lawrence Dysart. And Mr. Ramsdell is here to have some comments. Would you go to the podium or do you want to go sitting where the microphone is? Just so everyone can hear you. I'm sure you don't need your glasses? Bob's Good vision evening. has been questioned before. He's been a referee for about 40 years. You know. <laughs> Well, since the knees, since the knees left, uh, I left the game. Not tonight. Uh, we're here tonight. Uh, Larry Dysart, to me, uh, and a lot of people in town, was a special guy. Um, it, it just wasn't sports that he was involved with. And uh, if you can bear with me, I'm going to read a little thing that we had written up about Larry and his uh, participation in the town and for the youth. Uh, from the perspective of the North Reading community, any conversation about Larry Dysart has to start with his involvement in youth sports. Larry has been around for three generations of North Reading children. He has impacted hundreds of children in ways almost too numerous to mention. He was the player agent way back in the 70s for North Reading Little League. This was before computers stored all the information for everybody. He was the computer. When he left Little League, he did he did, did not stay in, inactive for long. What came next was approximately a 45-year labor of love with youth basketball. He started and nurtured the North Reading Youth Basketball Program for both boys and girls. Uh, also, I'd like, like to mention there's a gentleman that was with him, uh, Jeff Strong. He was uh, right along with Larry for quite a few years and a very capable individual. Um, he served almost every role throughout his time, from registrar to accountant to coaching and everything in between. He certainly had help along the way, but until his recent retirement from the board, he was the only one still involved in youth basketball from the beginning. As he gained experience, he enjoyed sharing his expertise, showing any interested party how to do things the right way. He was always practical, never political. The town recreation programs also benefited from Larry's expertise and clear vision, as he was a member of the recreation committee way back in the early 90s. He was on that board, well, I already read that. Larry was not only involved with Little League youth basketball, but he also found time to lend a helping hand to girls youth softball. Organization has always been his strong suit, but coaching was his love and passion. By the 90s, his daughter was long out of the youth basketball program, but he continued to coach a group of girls starting in the fifth grade and carried through with them to the eighth grade. He treated all level of players alike. With his coaching, he learned the game and often gave back to the program, teaching and mentoring younger girls. Larry not only helped North Reading girls succeed in the world of basketball, but many girls throughout the Merrimack Valley with his involvement in the River Valley Basketball League. He ran the program from scheduling to rules development which has helped them prosper for decades. Anyone who had a daughter playing travel basketball knew Larry. Any varsity girls player from North Reading could be sure of one thing. When she took the court, Larry would be there cheering her on. Only recently has he passed his basketball duties to the next generation, twice removed. La Mary Lou Dysart, Larry's wife of many years, was a remarkable woman in her own right. She supported and put up with her gym rat husband, <laughs> devotion to the game and to the youth of North Reading and beyond. 
Beyond Youth Sports, Larry and Mary Lou were both big supporters of the school system's band, choral, and theatrical programs in the 70s and 80s, as their three children, Lad, Buffy, and Peter, progressed through them. They supervised, fed, and chaperoned their children and their classmates. Of course, there were also enthusiastic audience members as well. Larry also traveled on the middle school trips that Charlie Jones, one of the longtime North Reading teachers, sponsored when they went out west, even though his children had moved on. Regular church goers, Larry and Mary Lou helped with coffee and donuts after the nine o'clock mass at St. Teresa's. Merrimack College also enjoys Larry's math expertise as he taught there and later tutored students for many years after his formal retirement. He also worked in software development for a number of years. Larry always carried himself with a smile and always took good-natured ribbing in a playful way. One of our names was, we used to call him Abe on the board because of his <laughs> beard and the white hair. He is soft-spoken and yet commands the respect of all, all those around him, a respect he has earned through his dedication, selflessness, and fairness. His dedication to the youth of North Reading is incalculable, touching the lives of so many boys and girls in town. He will also be remembered, he will always be remembered. Larry's first thought is never about himself, but always about what he could do for others. This is what makes Larry the great person that we all can aspire to be. There are few people that have positive, positively impacted children and adults to the extent that Larry has. When looking at the town of North Reading, Larry is right up there among the very top of the list. Thank you for your attention. That's nicely yeah. done, thank you. Tonight is his wife Mary Lou, uh, his daughter Buffy, and his other son Lad. Oh, nice. uh, Welcome. <laughs> unfortunately, uh, Larry, as I mentioned, is not doing very well, and he just could not muster enough strength to come tonight. So uh, please keep him in your prayers. So. And we have our esteemed guest as well, Representative Jones. Oh, right there is great. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, it really is a, uh, an honor to be here, and to me, Larry was my first coach, last coach, and only coach, um, most likely because I was a terrible basketball player. <laughs> uh, and to him, I'm probably his worst basketball player ever. Um, but he was a uh, larger-than-life, colorful, and caring character about town. Um, and the reality is communities like North Reading are built on the shoulders of volunteers like Larry Dyson. Uh, in Mary Lou. Um, we are a better community for him having volunteered his time and talent uh, in working with our youth. Uh, so it was uh, a wonderful ask of Bob when he asked if we could make some presentation uh, to Larry and the family uh, for his years of service. So it is a privilege for me to be here uh, and an honor to present this resolution, this joint resolution with the Senate uh, to the Dysart family committing Lawrence Dyset on his dedicated service to youth sporting leagues in the town of North Reading. Whereas Lawrence Larry Dysart became involved in youth sporting leagues in the town of North Reading in the 1970s, dedicating over 40 years of service to local youth in a November 18, 2019, family and friends will gather to celebrate his dedication to the communities he served. And whereas Larry first became involved in youth sports in the town of North Reading as the player agent for the town's little league program in the 1970s, which benefited many recreation programs in the town and surrounding areas. And whereas, while involved in the North Reading Little League and girls' youth softball, Larry also started the North Reading Youth Basketball Program for boys and girls and served in many, many roles in that program, including registrar, accountant, and coach. And whereas, Larry not only helped youth in the town of North Reading succeed in athletics, but also served as a positive influence for many young adults in the Merrimack Valley Youth Basketball League. And whereas, beyond youth sports, Larry and his wife, Mary Lou, have also remained active in the town's various community programs and activities. Therefore, be it resolved that the Massachusetts General Court hereby commends Lawrence Dysart on his dedicated service to the youth sporting leagues in the town of North Reading and further extends its sincere best wishes for health and happiness and be it further resolved that a copy of these resolutions be forwarded by the Clerk of the House to Larry Dysart and his family. And it's signed by the Speaker of the House, Robert DeLeo, 
The Clerk of the House, Stephen James, the President, uh, Senate President, Karen Spilka, the Clerk of the Senate, Mike Hurley, and offered by Senator Bruce Tyre and myself very proudly and adopted, and I'd like to present this to the Dysart family. Thank you. Thank you. Will we ask anyone else that would like to make some comments to step forward? If anyone else wants to comment, don't be shy. Come on up. Bob, thanks for the mention. Um, anyone who has ever played on um, one of Larry's teams will fondly remember the orange van with the purple stripe. <laughs> so not only would Larry coach and, you know, more than a coach, he was actually a teacher of the game, um, taught fundamentals very well um, so that the players would have, um, you know, a greater understanding and therefore um, more success on the court. And those lessons carried over into real life. After the game, there was always a stop at a famous um, fast food restaurant. And then the orange van with the purple stripe would ping pong around town and drive all the kids home. Something above and beyond the call of duty that we just don't see um, anymore. I had the pleasure of you know, working with Larry for many, many years. He eventually crossed over um, and joined my softball team as, as an assistant coach. Had a blast. Kids loved him. And it was just such a positive, positive thing. So I'm glad that we have the opportunity to recognize Larry today and um, thank the Board of Selectmen for doing so. The Select Board, sorry. That's all right. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, of course, I've known Larry and Mary Lou for decades, I guess. And uh, to Brad's point, you know, this community wouldn't be what it is today without people like uh, Larry and Mary Lou. Um, you know, because we all get involved, in, you know, because I, I was a terrible athlete when it came to basketball, too, so I, I didn't have the pleasure of being counseled or coached by Larry. But uh, by the same token, uh, my kids did. And um, Larry in particular, and Mary Lou, and their contributions to this community uh, Again, some of us choose to run for elective office and be a little more visible and public about things. And people like Larry and Mary Lou, um, very different. While they're visible in a significant part of this community, they truly are the thread of the fabric of this community. And to Brad's point, without people like them, we wouldn't have what we would call a community. We'd have a place to come home to every night and turn up the lights, go to sleep, go to work, and then uh, but Larry's contributions uh, to youth sports in North Reading are virtually unmatched. Um, you know, like, like a lot of us over the years who get involved with youth sports, you know, through coaching because our kids are involved. And again, uh, uh, you know, for Buffy and, and Lad and Peter, you know, that's why your parents got involved, you know, and they set a, a good example um, of you know, why let someone else coach my kid when I can do it? Because I'm concerned about who the other people are, but no. Uh, but truly, you know, we have something to offer here. And, you know, your dad and your mom uh, had a significant amount to offer, and it went beyond that. Uh, you appear as though you've graduated from all of this, you know, <laughs> just, the, just recently, just recently. Uh, but, but truly, your dad remained committed because he saw the impact, the positive impact that he could have on generations of our community and beyond our community. I mean, we're talking about the Merrimack Valley Regional League, and I remember seeing him one day, I said, what are you, I don't know where I bumped into him somewhere. I said, what are you doing? Oh, I'm doing the scheduling for this Merrimack River Valley League. And I'm going, why? You know, how many people? Are, oh, you have no idea how many teams are involved in the scheduling and the conflicts and the refereeing and the, everything that goes into it. And he said it with a smile. I mean, he just enjoyed so much having a positive impact and providing a venue for our youth to learn uh, teamwork, leadership, community skills, you know, that go far beyond the skills of, of playing the basketball game or the softball game. 
So, you know, when Bob contacted us and said, you know, hey, how about us? It was like no hesitation, you know. Larry and Mary Lou, I mean, you've been there through every single bit of it, uh, along with a, a whole host of other uh, community organizations and groups that you've been involved with. And for that, we're, we're eternally grateful. The community is a far better place uh, uh, for Larry's service and your service. And uh, personally, you know, you've been uh, good, active members of the community. Again, without passing judgment, uh, expressed your opinions. Let us know where you, where you stand on things. And it's always been in a positive, smiling uh, way. And it's just had such a significant positive impact. And for that, we're extremely grateful. And it is an honor to be here tonight to, uh, to recognize uh, Larry's efforts and uh, long overdue. Thank you. Mr. Schultz. 40 years of dedicated service that that is such a long time for uh, you know Larry wasn't isn't an elected official but he was really an official of the town and how many kids pass through his programs and I can't even think 40 years ago the amount of girls that may have not have access to sports that they have today because of people like Larry and it's a whole different gender to now play sports that didn't so much 40 years ago to the Dysar family, I know this is probably a bittersweet time for you to be here tonight. Uh, I know Larry's not feeling well, and all I can say is that I hope Larry's at peace, and God bless you and your family. Thank you. Not sure that I can add anything more to what was said so eloquently, and we do hope he's listening and hope he's um, hearing all of these accolades, and I think one of the things that we all remember when we are young is who our coaches were by name, by style, by how they lead us. And I think that that's a wonderful example. And I don't think I need to say anything more than what was commented other than to read you this citation that the board has. It's a certificate of appreciation. The select board and the town of North Reading are pleased to present this remembrance of their high regard and appreciation to Lawrence Larry Dysart in recognition of over four decades of service to North Reading's youth sports and recreational programs as a coach, league board member, mentor, and supporter by the select board of the North Town of
Thank you. Moving right along to our next recognition, we are here to recognize Assistant Building Inspector Albert DeSalvo this evening. And Michael, did you prepare work? <laughs> yes, so we have another uh, certificate of recognition. Yes. We also have some other uh, information that we uh, wanted to, uh, to He's going to give a little history and a I background. <laughs> So just as a little bit of background for, uh, for folks, um, Al started working for the town of North Reading in July of 1999, uh, and at the time he was in the engineering department assisting with the town's role in the reconstruction of the Route 62 project, which I'm not sure if they were quite at construction at that point or, in, or just, just entering, in, entering into that, but he actually started in that department and then moved over to the building department as a local inspector. Um, it's a role that he held until his retirement on November 1st, Al also had 30 years of service in the United States Coast Guard from 1964 to 1994. During this time, he earned a Coast Guard Commendation Medal, Coast Guard Achievement Medal, and Humanitarian Service Medal. Um, Al's official retirement date with the Middlesex County Retirement System is, was Friday, November 1st. However, he has graciously agreed to continue to assist the town on a part-time basis helping us with local inspections as the town um, uh, responds to a recent uptick in construction activity, which we've talked about here with the board, including the Pulte <coughs> Homes project on Lower Road. So while we congratulate him on his retirement, we also say thank you for your willingness to continue to help us out on a part-time basis. Reeling him back in. That's correct. Um, so when uh, Al was recognized by the employees here in Town Hall on November 1st, um, the building inspector who was seated uh, right next to Kathy, who was also the administrative assistant for the department, uh, put together this plaque, which I'm going to read here. Um, it's a certificate of appreciation presented to Albert Al DeSalvo, building inspector safety official. Something to inspect right out of the gate. <laughs> <laughs> He's not the electrical inspector. <laughs> 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 Great time. <laughs> For your outstanding professional service in public safety and your enforcement of the Massachusetts State Building Code and local ordinances and your commitment to the building department, we want to recognize you with boundless gratitude. From the building department, inspectional service department, and your friends and colleagues in the town of North Reading, Massachusetts, we award this, this first day of November 2019. Thank you for your 20 years of service. Al? yet <laughs> if we did anyone would anyone else like to make some comments we're here we're all here would we like to make some comments before we read our proclamation yeah. we want to thank you for your service I would. oh wonderful you might need to take a seat for this. <laughs> yeah we can take a seat <laughs> yeah oh that'd be great well those of you sure. I'm, I'm the building commissioner I know, uh, when I first started here, starting in North Reading, I told I was going to be supervising Al DeSalvo. I was like, Al DeSalvo, that sounds familiar. <laughs> so, <laughs> then, in all honesty, <laughs> it, I mean, it sounds so cliche to say I was lucky to have Al, and Al was a, a, a great inspector. It sounds cliche. In this case, it's true. And I've told Al more than once, uh, out of the inspectors I've worked with over the past 10 years, <clears throat> he's, I would say, the best that I work with. And I've, I've had the privi privilege to work with him, and hopefully I can continue that for a while. That's great. So stay working. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs>
involved all the town employees I worked with and all the years that I put into the town. Uh, I just want to make one little correction. Back in 1965, 66, um, Rita Mullen hired me first <laughs> <laughs> to do a work on that project. That's so awesome. I was working for the town off and on before um, 1999. Duly noted. Wow. <laughs> so noted. Excellent. Excellent. All through the years, I was, I've been real happy working for the town. That's great. And I appreciate everything the town's done. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I just want to read the certificate of recognition from the select board. The select board in the town of North Reading are pleased to present this remembrance of their high regard and appreciation to Albert L. DeSalvo in recognition of over 20 years of faithful and conscientious service as an employee of the building department from the select board. That's right. Nobody should feel obligated to hang around for the rest of the meeting. <laughs> I know. Should, should I tell them that? I know. It's, only, yeah, it's only the tax classification. <laughs> can I go then? You can stay. <laughs> yeah. I'll wait for it. <laughs> Do the administrative things? Yes, let's do that. Can we <laughs> can we go to me meeting minutes? Yes, please. Madam, Madam Chair, I move to approve the October 28, 2019 regular session minutes right. as written. I want to bang the gavel? All right, I have a motion. I have a motion to approve the regular minutes. Do I have a second? Bang the gavel. To the gavel. All right. Second. All right, I have a. <laughs> I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Unanimous. Any public comment? Hearing none. <laughs> Madam Chair, I move to approve the October 28, 2019 executive session minutes as written. Second. I have a motion, I have a second. A motion by Ms. Gonzalez, a second by Ms. Drolia. All those in favor? Aye. Terrific. <laughs> is anyone here for public comment? Thank you so much. <laughs> I think there is going to be somebody here for a time. Okay, let's let's move on to board board. <laughs> for you. I feel bad for you. Nobody listens anyway. I feel bad for you. Hearing none, let's move on to public comment. Anybody here for public comment? Public comment? Anybody here for public comment this yep. evening? Okay. Hopefully we'll see you back 
Now? See it? Is that when the Christmas uh, thing is? Turkey. 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 Light up the Light up. Light up the Well, I'm at the. Uh, is that going to be after Brad's event? Alright. Right. Yeah. I know. It's such a nice thing. I know. I know. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. I wouldn't do it either. We still. We have a quorum. I don't know. Anybody want to donate? Yeah. <laughs> That's number eight. Come down. Patrons. All right. You want to? Want to? We have. We just have a few things on the agenda to get through before the public hearing at eight. Kate, Thank you. Thank the, you for uh, the donuts. Kate, the, Kate, the people from the moose are here. You want to do them now? Yeah. So they have to wait all night. Yeah. Let's call that one. You guys here for the moose? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do, do we do ahead. board member reports? Well, why don't we? Make so they can leave. Free. Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Unless well, you want to stay. How are you? I see you. Good to see you again. Yep. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Soon, probably. Well, in your case, we seem to be meeting a lot. That's item number eight. Thank you. We're doing good, though. We're almost made yeah. it to the 8 o'clock hour. But. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Good job, Bob. Nice job. That was great. Thank you. All right. So we, we did we did pass the minutes. We did the recognitions. Do we have board member reports? I'll call that one again. Mr. O'Leary, um, well, you good? Now, Mr. Walder? I just briefly, um, I did get to attend the um, facilities master planning um, assessment of uh, suppliers who will be doing the studies. And um, I was only a guest. I wasn't voting, but it was um, a good three-hour session, and uh, at the end, they picked the same one I would have picked, and so everybody was on the same page. So I feel like the supplier is really good, understands what we're doing, had a good background for what we're trying to accomplish, and uh, expect nothing but good. So I have no, no idea what the outcome was from that meeting, but that was that was the, that was the decision everybody had made. So, yeah. Um, and then I'm looking forward to Working with Mike tomorrow, we're going over some AARP stuff, uh, trying to get that going. Perfect. And um, I think that's probably the biggest deal. Yeah. Right. <coughs> Mr. Schultz. It's nothing new. Ms. Gonzalez. Yes, um, I would just briefly like to talk about the um, open space and recreation plan. We had our first meeting last Tuesday. Excellent committee. We're focused on getting feedback from the community to know where the committee should put their priorities and vision. Um, we are going to do that in two ways. First, a survey, which is available both online and in hard copy. Uh, I just want to give the address is www.mapc.ma slash park survey. Encourage everybody to get out there and um, get on your computers take the survey it's quick it's anonymous it gives feedback um, if you don't have a computer you can go to the library they'll help you um, you can come into town hall there's hard copies at the planning um, office and um, we're also having a public meeting on December 5th for public discussion and questions and I encourage everybody to join us right here in room 14 um, I think that's it. 6.30. 6.30 to 8.30. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to reflect between last meeting and this meeting, we had Veterans Day. So I just wanted to thank Sue Magner and all the veterans that uh, came to the event for Ms. Gonzalez for bringing the, um, for speaking on behalf of the board. Michelle O'Keefe, who was the um, speaker, the keynote speaker and all of the veterans that were there and showed up to make that event a memorable event for the town and for our veterans. And um, with that, I think we can move on to public comment. Is anybody here for public comment? <laughs> Doesn't look like it. We asked that three times, so. Oh, can I just say one more? Oh, of course. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I wanted to bring attention to the North Reading seniors annual Thanksgiving dinner on Sunday, which all the seniors are invited to. If you haven't 
um, reserved a spot yet, there's still plenty of room, and please call in and reserve a spot. We'd love to see you. Thank you. All right. We're up to change of manager for the loyal order of Moose. Why don't you come on up and take a seat at the table and introduce yourselves to the board. I don't. My name is David George, and first of all, I apologize for being like this, dressed like this. I was late getting out of work. No apologies. No, you don't need to. And this, is my, and this is my wife, Carol Ann George. <laughs> There's no dress code here. You're good. Oh, well, yeah. just the same. Just for us. <laughs> okay. yeah. No ball gowns required. <laughs> all right. So I think it's pretty self explanatory, Mr. Gilberto. I don't know if you want to add anything. The, pa the board packet is just a change. Yep, it's a standard change of manager. Um, we have had discussions with the current manager, and um, we understand there's going to be a transition in, in the oversight there. Um, it's, uh, I don't think it's completely unexpected. I think it's kind of been in the works for a little while. And um, they've submitted the paperwork here, and we're here this evening with the hearing uh, to recommend the, uh, the transfer, um, as is the case with any other cha excuse me, the change of manager. As is the case with any other, other transaction, it will go to the Alcoholic Beverage Com Control Commission for final approval, but we don't foresee any hiccup in that process. And your current manager is? David Shutner. David Shutner. Oh, and yes. who's your proposed manager? David I George. am David George. Okay. Yeah, Mr. George will be the, the manager of record, All assuming right. the board votes favorably and the ABCC signs off. <laughs> All right. And does any, do any of the members have any questions? Just Mr. One. Schultz. And there's no changes to the operation? No. Nope. Hours? And Everything's the same. Okay. Just uh, David wanted to kind of retire a little bit, so I told him if we're on the administrator, I'll... You were the low bidder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He missed the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> they elected him. Yeah, that's when he was clerk. That's why I never miss a meeting. <laughs> Anybody else have any, any other members have any questions? Uh, just the basic question about tips trained and all the rest that yes. go along with it. Yep. Yeah. That's Great. Okay. Do I have a motion? Madam Chair, I move to approve a change of manager for the club license for the Loyal Order of Moose, 140 North Street, from David Shutner to David George. Second. The motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Aye. Thank you very much. That wasn't too difficult. That was easy. That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. All right. Always a fun topic of conversation. Our next order of business is waste and wastewater update. Come on up. <laughs> Everybody left, but they're listening. And there's, there's been a lot of things written and posted, and you'll probably have an, uh, an audience listening in on your update tonight. Through you, Madam Chair. I, I'm going to ask, perhaps the DPW director could just give the, the update relative to the rechlorination facility, sure. because I think that being addressed obviously puts us in line with the schedule that I believe Mr. Williamson right. is going to go through. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. I'll make it up. Okay. Uh, yeah, he can. Do you need to? Yeah, we still <coughs> Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. So. Rob Williamson and Mike Stein here from Wright Pierce, they're going to give us an update on the water and wastewater projects that are ongoing uh, and in planning. And part of what Rob's going to talk to us about is the water FEIR um, permitting process and where we are with that. Uh, we have made some considerable progress, I think, since the last time we've been here. Part of that, prog uh, part of that process is we needed to find a location for a chlorination facility. And I know I've been here in front of the board before, and I think others, others have spoken as well. Um, we, we, had, we needed a site that was on North Main Street, close to the Andover line, where we pick up uh, the water main from Andover. We looked at a number of different sites there. We looked um, pretty intensely at, at, at a few sites, and we've settled on one now that I think uh, Mark Clark, the water superintendent, as well as the consultants will agree is the most favorable site from, from a, a functional <coughs> standpoint. So we've had uh, ongoing negotiations with the owner of that site, and I think we're very near the end of that. Uh, I think. We got, we, we just need to finalize those negotiations. Uh, we looked at the cost of, of the various sites and we compared those and made sure that what we were getting um, at, at this final location was comparable to what we would get at other sites for a similar cost. Um, it's, again, the costs have to do with 
The cost can be broken down into the cost of the facility itself, which is just a concrete block uh, building. Um, it's going to have some uh, appurtenances to it that will make it match the existing structure at this location. And then there's some piping that needs to, to happen, obviously, to connect the facility to the water main out in, in Main Street. Um, and what we have to do is we have to make some improvements to the site that um, to return the site to, a, to, to its pre-construction condition, which I think is reasonable. Uh, so what we're offering at this site is to replace the, uh, the, the paving in that location, maybe do a little bit extra so that it looks a little bit cleaner. We're going um, to we're going to seal coat the entire parking lot. You know, it's a commercial facility, active restaurant, and we're going to uh, restripe it. So, without getting into the specifics of the sites we looked at, I think we did a we we looked pretty intently at um, what we're getting at this site, and I think um, we're all happy that we've settled on something finally. So you'll hear, you'll hear Rob will mention that, you know, this was one of the main points of the one of the main things we needed to uh, finalize before we can proceed with the FEIR. And he's got some things to point out. We were gathering some information from Andover, but I'll let him get into that if, if, if you don't mind, Madam yes, Chair. that's great. Okay, thank you. Madam, Madam Chair, I, I don't think I'm overstepping my bounds, but the specific location, which I think the DPW director is hesitating to say, um, the specific site that we're talking about is the Dos Lobos Plaza, which is on the northbound side of Route 28. 303 Main Street, yes. Uh, so um, when you're looking at that, it looks like a, the ideal spot um, for locating this in terms of the available properties. Um, I'll also note as well that you know, we, we, we are likely to do so in the form of an easement rather than an, as a, a property taking as well. So that'll be coming back, back before the board for uh, action at a future meeting as well. Thank you, Mr. Actually, Gilbert. There's actually been seven sites that we've looked at. Oh. Yeah. So m multiple sites that we, we have evaluated. Again, I don't want to get into the details of specific locations, but we've... I think the spirit of the conversation have been try to amicably work out um, and identify the right site, and that, that has brought us to where we're at today right. with the Dos Lobos location. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, thank you. So I will, I will um, talk about the water projects related to the FEIR, and then Mike will come up and talk a little bit about the progress on the wastewater. So there's, um, there's, a couple, there's three parts to this. You, it's the FEIR. I just want to go back a little bit to make sure everyone's caught up to date. There's the FEIR, which is the report that's needed. Um, we need approval from MEPA, and you need an um, interbasin transfer permit before you can start accepting water from Andover. Um, and this, this um, report, per se, has been in the works for quite some time. Uh, happy to, to report that we finally have all the data that we needed to finalize that report. Uh, we had, since the last time we gave you an update, we had met with Andover, um, had, uh, was able to collect a lot of the information that we still needed from them. Um, there were some things they chose not to follow up on that we took upon ourselves um, to advance. So all that information now we have, it's all being collated, um, and the, the report will start coming together. Um, as Pat had mentioned this, the second part of that are the projects um, needed or that are required to actually connect you to Andover, and that being the chemical feed facilities and the water mains. Um, the FEIR, um, as part of that, we have to re report in detail the projects that are associated with the water transfer. The water mains are not part of that, but the chemical buildings and the facilities are. So we have not, we, um, until I'm hearing now that it sounds like we are going to go ahead with this one property, we have not been able to um, prepare any of the details or the plans needed to submit with the FEIR. So now that, now that we know this, um, that'll allow us to move forward um, with pre uh, preparing at least site plans and things of that nature that need to be included with the FEIR. Um, again, the FEIR is, is a, it's a report to MEPA, which is a, a government agency at the state level that looks at the impacts to the environment of, a, of projects um, based on certain criteria. So that's, that's what we're reporting on. Um, so regarding the report again, um, you know, we have all the data. Now we know what we need um, to do with the chemical feed station so we can complete that task. And then we're looking at a tentative submission date of the FERR probably in February. The things have, because of the delays in getting the site, um, secured, there have been delays because this is a key component of the FEIR. Uh, but we are, I'm going to talk about that in a second. Now I'll talk about the two infrastructure projects, the, the chemical feed stations and the water mains. So the, for the chemical feed stations, there's the two sites. There's now the Main Street site that we have and then the Central Street site. 
now that both of them are secured uh, internally our team is having a kickoff for final design on that um, we're hoping to have that at the end of this week early next week what that'll do is that will release all of our disciplines from the site people and structural and architectural all our process folks to start designing these these facilities and uh, be able to pull together the appropriate details that we need to include with the report so right now we uh, if you recall there were some other sites that we were pr pretty heavily invested in that didn't pan out um, and that preliminary work on those sites involves survey and geotechnical work we also have to do that at this site on central street uh, not central on main street central street's already taken care of um, so we're scheduling the driller geotechnical technical firm and then we have a surveyor um, we actually don't have to do full survey because the dos Lobos property owner had some work done prior in years before we're going to be able to use their survey uh, but we have a survey firm on on um, our team who's going to put together easement plans and things necessary for you folks um, that will be part of the overall plan to access your building once it's constructed um, <coughs> tentatively the schedule would be uh, design would be completed um, probably late spring early f um, late spring early summer and then we could move into bidding pending um, the feedback we're getting on the submission of the FEIR. Now again, you technically need approval from MEPA to start advancing your infrastructural projects, um, but I think with as much as we've been working with MEPA over the years, we should be able to get some feedback that will allow you at least to advertise and start getting bids for these things before actually putting a bucket in the ground and start building them. Um, and if everything went perfectly, you could probably start constructing those facilities probably late summer, early fall. It's a, uh, we're estimating it's probably going to be about a one-year project, although these facilities are not large per se. Um, the, le the, the time that it takes to put them together often is dictated by the equipment that you purchase and the lead times on that and things of that nature. So overall, it'll take about a year, <coughs> we're, we're predicting, to build both stations. Um, and then moving on to the second project, although not technically required um, for uh, or included in the FEIR, there are some water main upgrades um, that we're pursuing to increase the size of the mains beginning really along Main Street from where the main feed from Andover will be coming in, um, along Main Street and North Street. Those have been under design for quite some time now. Uh, we're hoping to have them done this winter. We'll have those plans done. Um, but I noted what I note here is we're gonna we had been talking about this with the um, the committee that's the the committee that's been involved in working with us on this that we're gonna advertise and bid the water mains after we receive bids for the chemical feed stations and that's because you you folks have a fixed um, allocation of money of six million dollars for the total project we want to understand what the chemical feed stations cost come in at we, you know we have an estimate but in the end the cost is what the bids come in at. So once we understand what the cost of that is, then the balance will be able to allocate to the water mains. We may be able to build everything we intend to build. It may mean we have to pull pieces out or perhaps bid portions of the water main as additive alternates to the contractor. So depending on how the water main prices come in, um, that may dictate how much can get added or subtracted from the project. So it's, it's kind of an iterative process that happens. So that one, again, in a perfect world, if we, we bid um, following the receipt of bids on the chemical station, um, potentially you could, might be able to start construction on the water mains uh, late next fall. You know, if we get someone on board and they really want to start, then a contractor wants to start, then he could. Um, more likely, most of them would probably defer and, and push it over to the spring of the next year. Um, there's quite a lot of um, pipe involved in that project and we're going down Route 28, it's going to be slow work, so we're projecting if all of the project as we have conceptualized um, were to be constructed, it's probably going to be about uh, one and a half years to fully complete that work. So those are the two infrastructure projects. <coughs> And this is a similar schedule that I had presented to you um, previously at the last time with the update. As you can see, everything's kind of shifted um, a few months further along because of um, us wanting to be able to, or 
the need to get this site secured on Main Street for the chemical fill, uh, feed building that's dictated everything. There's a couple things I want to point out. What has shifted from last time to this time is the water main sequence has, and the chemical feed building sequence has, has flip-flopped. Um, before, I think we may have shown them almost going concurrent or the water mains going first. Um, we have switched that so now that bidding will happen after we receive bids from the chemical stations and construction will be going on technically at the same time, but we'll bid that later. And the other key point I want to <coughs> note is the 7-1 date in 2021. That's the kind of the self-imposed deadline when you want to be officially connected. Um, to the Andover system. It's July 1, 2021. Right now the schedule's showing we're awfully darn close. You know, we're, we're right on the cusp of it. Um, right now I consider that kind of a wash that we're, we're making that date with having the chemical feed facilities done and being able to be connected. Now there's, there's variables in here that none of us can, can um, change. You know, the, the uh, approval of, it, of the FEIR through the state. Well, they have, although they have some prescribed dates and, and limits when they have to turn things around, that, that's always something you just can't control. Um, I don't expect any issues with that. I, I just point that out because it's the reality of it. But I think with as much as, um, you know, your team and our team have been working with these folks for so long, uh, we don't expect any issues with that. We actually submitted a draft of the FEIR to, um, to the Water Resources um, Commission, uh, when did we do that, beginning of October, because there was a key um, member of their team who was leading the effort of that review who was retiring, and she offered to review what we had prepared already. Uh, we got her comments back and have already integrated all that. So the, you know, these are all good positive things that have happened. Um, so it, it should move pretty fluidly from here on out now that really all the, the pieces are starting to fall together. So, kind of a brief, quick synopsis, and I'd be happy to entertain any. Mr. Gilberto. I don't have a question. I'm going to attempt to summarize, and the DBW director or the consulting engineer can correct me, but there's been a lot of work that's been going on in the background, and at different points in time we've come in here and provided an update, but two very significant issues have been, um, you know, we believe resolved to the point where we can now move them forward and that is gathering information relative to our permit application and nailing down the location for the chlorination facility so you know we're right there in terms of the timeline that we uh, imposed upon ourselves now five years ago um, extended by the two years for the, the effort to look at Andover but nonetheless we are right there looking at that timeline of July 1st 2021 as the, the goal for being able to obtain all of our water from from um, from Andover, and that that's you know certainly the schedule is close, but the news is encouraging uh, to be at this point in time, given all of the effort that's gone in the background by the the gentlemen on the other sides of the tables here, as well as Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Schultz, um, and uh, Mr. Masseri as well. So, does anyone have any questions of our experts or our director while they're here? <coughs> Pretty straightforward. Okay. Okay. Forward sure. progress. All right. Yes. Yeah. Thank exactly. you. Exactly. Thank you. So I will turn it over to Mike, and um, he can give a quick preview of um, where we are on the wastewater projects. Thank you, Rob. So my name is Mike Stein. I'm with Wright Pierce Engineers. Uh, what you see in front of you is the overall layout of the sewer system within the town of North Reading. Um, Looking at the map, north is to the right. You can see the, the areas that, that will have uh, sewer are highlighted. For example, you have Main Street, Route 28, uh, that's highlighted from, from the uh, Reading Town Line up to the Andover Town Line. And then you can see Concord Street is highlighted going out towards Wilmington. And then you can see that North Street uh, is also highlighted going out to Lowell Street um, to pick up a section of Lowell Street um, in, in that area. Some of, the, some of the tasks we've been working on are the phasing of the project, um, looking at feasibility of implementing this project in, in multiple phases. Fortunately, with the way Main Street is laid out, 
um, as far as topo topography um, that presents itself quite nicely to be able to uh, phase this project in. What I mean by phasing it in, um, doing a section at, at a time trying to make make the project more affordable so so the town doesn't have to do the project in, in one shot. So going to two, the, the, the affordability, that's what's driving the, uh, the uh, phases. Um, so with, with, with the affordability, what we're trying to do, we're trying to provide the uh, best bang for the town's buck, very, very simply. Um, also with, with uh, the phasing of, of the project, one of the things that we're looking at is not just where we, we can phase in Main Street, Concord Street, North Street, and Lowell Street, but down the road when, when this is designed, we also need to think about phasing in other places in town at some future date down the road. So, so the infrastructure that, that is designed and put in has to be able to accommodate any type of future expansion of the system. And I'm talking way, way down the road. And then the uh, third task is that we're also going to be looking at the projected tax revenue. Um, a previous consultant did that back in, I uh, believe, in 2011. So just looking at parcel usage um, and, and, and phasing. The thing about this, what, what, what I'm showing you, is that this is really just half, half of the uh, project. Um, Somehow, North Reading needs to get their wastewater to greatest, Greater Lawrence Sanitary District, okay? And we're going to be doing that by using, by sending it through the uh, town of Andover. And with their other g concerns going on up there, we just haven't been able to um, make contact with them in order to schedule meetings, in order to, to get their input ab about their system. So, and, and, and until we get that part of the project, we, we get more in depth than that. Uh, the, uh, the phasing of this project and the affordability, plus the projected tax revenue, still remains kind of in, incomplete at that point, at, at this point. Um, with that, I open up the questions. Mr. Gilberto. So I think another component of this is you know, we've been asking for a lot of information from the town of Andover. And we're at a point now where, you know, at this stage we have what we require for the FEIR for the water permitting. Uh, we'll be in a position where, you know, in addition to the in internal work we'll be looking to do within North Reading's borders, we're going to be asking them for some assistance in evaluating their system for the, 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 the feasibility and the improvements that may need to be made between the North Reading Andover town line and the, uh, the plant, which is located actually in North Andover. Um, so that'll be a significant effort that, and an ask that we'll be bringing to um, to Andover in the coming months. And we'll continue to keep you informed. Mr. Schultz. I, actually, this is probably for Madam Chair. I know in the past, the last iteration of sewer, probably, Steve, 10 years ago maybe, when last time we addressed this ballpark, yeah. there was a wastewater subcommittee that was full of citizens and stakeholders that I think is still on the books as being an open committee. I think I'm sure all the terms have expired, but... Um, are we going to fill that with, with stakeholders and people in the business community and people, you know, environmental folks, DPW? I think that's something we should really address. So I think it's, it's such a big project. It's hard for two volunteer select board members. I mean, I know I worked during the day and I can't make all the meetings. And Steve, you have the other obligations as well. I think a subcommittee is really warranted on this, such a big project. I didn't know what the board's <coughs> thoughts were on that. So, Mr. Gilberto, do you have information about a subcommittee? I have seen a reference <coughs> to a, a, a wastewater me. committee. Um, it probably dates to at least 2011, I believe. Okay. Um, How many members are on it? Are uh, it was larger. I, I'm going off the top of my head now, but I want to say it was probably either se seven members or so. Okay. Um, you know, we should uh, resurrect that committee and see if we can get some community stakeholders to participate on that one. Mr. O'Leary? I don't see a sense of urgency yet. 
Uh, I think uh, if we work at the current structure that we have, which is you know, internally the administration, the consultants, and our subcommittee here, uh, to get it to a point where we have a more definitive plan and more concrete costs in relation to um, cost of improvements up in Andover, as well as you know what we're, how we're going to phase whether we make a determination to phase it here or not. Again, that's a board decision. Um, and then we need to start building uh, some public support, get the stakeholders involved when we have a plan. I, I just would caution about creating a, a huge subcommittee or another subcommittee at this point when we're still at the beginning stages. Well, we've, a lot of work has been done. We still have a lot more work to do to even decide how we're going to do and what and the board has to make a decision as to how we're going to phase it in or whether we're going to go for the whole ball of wax. Once we make those decisions, I think that's when we should get the other stakeholders involved. Uh, yeah, otherwise, I just don't want to see uh, an inordinate amount of time and resources from our administration, our consultants, and board members here um, trying to build public support for what we don't know yet. You know? My concern is I think Andover is going to need a real push throughout this whole project. I know how hard it was for you guys to get what you needed for, for the water. And, the, you know, the statute of limitations on we don't have time because of Columbia Gas, I think, has run. We need their cooperation on this, and it's important. It's one of the things that I was literally about signing with them in the first place is once they got us on the dotted line, are they going to come through on the sewer piece? I think we need stakeholders to be pushing Andover and pushing, just keep, this is only going to get done if we push it. Yeah, but I, I, yeah. I, don't, I don't think, you know, uh, putting a sub subcommittee together of, you know, property owners in, in North Reading and, you know, business people or whomever it's going to be is going to have any influence on, on the town of Andover. <coughs> the influence with the town of Andover is, first of all, a cooperative effort, joint effort, uh, which has already taken place, you know, between uh, previous board, this board, and future boards, you know, with the town of Andover. Andover did make a commitment in their long-term agreement with us, with water, to assist and facilitate um, getting us into the Greater Lawrence Sewer District. They have a seat at the table there and have uh, committed to supporting the effort. Uh, we've already had preliminary meetings a couple of the last year uh, up with the Greater Lawrence Sewer District. Uh, and the key factor that we need from them is, uh, is the analysis of their system to determine exactly what type of upgrades and improvements need to be made in order to take the effluent from here up through and up to Greater Lawrence. Uh, we were asked by them uh, several months ago, you know, what's our priority, water or sewage? Because again, this is uh, labor intensive for them, uh, resource intensive for them. It's going to require their consultants also and them expending some money to assist us uh, to get the answers that we need. Uh, and we certainly said water is, 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 water is, is the primary need. Why, does, why can't they walk and chew gum at the same time? They, they can and they have been. Well, they need to do more. Yeah. We're, not, we're not getting I, what we need on the sewer piece. You know, I, I, think yeah. the, uh, uh, I think we've had a significant amount of cooperation with Andover, which is greatly appreciated. Uh, I think the resources that they've expended to get the final answers for the FEIR filing was critical. Um, but how hard did you guys have to push it, it, to get the info? It's not a question of how, it's a question of you know, them committing resources. The, the benefit to Andover of us tying into Greater Lawrence Sewer District is negligible. All they're going to get is a wheeling charge out of this. And we're going to be digging up their streets in order to facilitate, you know, getting our up through contract. there. They signed a contract. They All signed right, a contract. No, excuse yeah. me. They, they signed yeah. a contract for let's water. Let's not interrupt no, but, one another. No, but they, they signed a contract for water, and in those negotiations, we created the linkage, and right. they agreed that it was important. And again, they understand that future economic development in the town of North Reading does benefit them because they can sell more water. You know? yeah. So there is a, there is some linkage there, <laughs> okay. uh, and we helped project that get them to buy into it, and they did. However, you know, so uh, so far the relationship has been very good. Uh, there's been some bumps in the road, but it's been very good overall. Uh, the facilitating, the FEIR filing, the uh, increase in the uh, limitations of water that can be drawn for the permitting, uh, which is critical for us. <coughs> and again, we had asked them during those negotiations to allow us, to assist us, tying into Greater Lawrence Sewer District, and they've agreed to do that. So again, they've had some challenges with the uh, Columbia Gas. They've had challenges, and again, expenses uh, associated with getting the FEIR filed. So I, I don't think there's a, a need at this point other than continuing the efforts that we have already been making uh, to ask them for their assistance. And it's certainly appreciated at this point. 
And I think uh, the best way to go about that is the manner in which we're using it right now. And again, I don't see a subcommittee assisting in the process at all, other than helping us build public support here in North Reading. It's not going to have any influence in Andover. Mr. Gilberto, are there any current members on that subcommittee that it goes back to 2011? So, so my records, just going on to the town clerk's, I should say the town clerk's records, show a seven-member water and wastewater planning advisory committee with three, it lists three active members and four vacant terms, but one of the active members is identified as Mr. Masseri in his role as a select board member, which of course he is no longer. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a CPC representative, Mr. Pierce, and then there's a uh, unaffiliated uh, member, um, Mr. Luke Roy. I'm sure those terms are all up, though, aren't they, Mike? Uh, so these were terms that did not have uh, an, an expiration date when the individuals were appointed. Unlimited. That's why they're still showing up. Yeah. Lifetime indefinite. appointments. <laughs> we, have, well, we have a few of those indefinitely. There's a, a paragraph for a charge for it, but I, I think what it basically says is that this would be a committee not just for wastewater but also for water as well yeah. at the time it was And I think I know the chamber uh, executive director of the chambers here. I think the chamber should have a seat at this table. The business community needs to be part of this, and I think they need to be part of it now, not later. So, uh, Ms. All right. So, m members, there. If, if the other members have any comments, I'd like to hear. And Mr. Gilberto had his hand up. And we do. I just want to remind you, we do have an eight o'clock hearing too, that we're a little bit behind on getting to. But not too bad. Um, from from any other member have any comment that they'd like to add to this discussion? <laughs> um, Mr. Walmart, well, you I guess seem like you want to comment. So. Yeah, well, I just <laughs> wanted to ask, because I was going to ask about the Andover and what their motivation is to work with us, because that does seem to be the holdup. Are you saying we can't get the projected revenue on number three until we get further progress on Andover? With Andover, okay. So I jumped up here. I just want to make two comments. I noticed that. One, <laughs> we absolutely need your support to get them engaged. No question. A hundred percent. We can't do it by ourselves. Um, number two, in, in terms of a committee, I might suggest, I think a committee is really important. It's been really helpful on the water side, but it, I think it'll be more effective when these two studies are done. Um, when you choose to do is up to you, but at the end of these, you're going to have a plan, at least something to look at, and then you're going to be able to start talking about how it's going to come together. That was my only, just mm -hmm. suggestions, only two comments. But, First and foremost, we are absolutely going to need your help. Until, so let me back up a little bit, and I'm kind of speaking for Mike. The original costs that were developed that we, um, for improvements needed to Andover, were done completely in a vacuum. We had to do them all on our own, based on limited information they gave us. We had to make an assessment and come up with some costs. That's not been vetted with them. They've had no input to that. That was just the way the process worked. What we need now is them to get involved and say, we're sitting at a table with them, we're gonna say, this is what we're seeing, your system needs to be improved, do you concur or not, what are we missing? So that we can refine yeah. those numbers. Really, those, those numbers are, are better than a dartboard, but not a whole heck of a lot better, because it, they've been done in a vacuum. I don't know if you want anything to that, but that's really what the next step is, to get them involved, to refine, refine the costs needed at Andover so they can be folded into the financial study so we can understand the total magnitude of the cost of the project. Because the cost is North Reading and over Andover's costs. Mr. Walner. So, you know, there's suggestions, the subcommittee now, or continue to work with the group that you already have. What do you suggest to, to make it get to the next level? Um, well, again, whatever committee or select board or whatever, we're going to need the pressure to help get them engaged. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. from um, the perspective of how this project is developed and comes together, again, I would probably suggest, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, wait till this, these studies are both done, so at least then you have something on paper that everyone can look at. Right now, it's, I'm not sure there'd be much um, value because it's really kind of convoluted numbers and things we're dealing okay. with. Right, yeah, I would definitely, I, I, I concur that we, we need to be uh, quite a bit further along, something on paper, something that people can Before. actually re re relate to. Before you can correct. I don't disagree yeah. with you with all, yeah. Andrew. It's going to be needed. Because you guys had, it's just I mean, a question. I, I don't want to throw in under the bus because they are cooperating with someone on the, on the water. But I know you guys are delayed on the water piece 
by not getting information from them. And if that's what it's like on the water, where they're actually getting money, I think the community needs to be formed now and needs to be public pressure. Uh, but just public awareness that, hey, we're trying to do this, but we need your help. Well, the you know, committee, the committee's actually already formed. Yeah. And I don't see any issue with recruiting. We see the fellow. And, and actually, this piece of it is is something that they could get up to speed on, although, you know, the current members most likely are. And Mr. Mosseri is actually our citizen appointee from this board. I don't see any issue with them getting up to speed on this portion and, you know, recruiting additional members while this is going on and understanding the difficulties you are dealing with because like Mr. Schultz, yeah. that was a selling feature to me signing on with them knowing that it took the board prior to when I served years to get that agreement just for the water. So the expectation is going to be the same kind of dragging of the feet years to get this sewer and it is compelling for us and it is necessary for us and it is important to have stakeholders involved now so that they see we're committed to this and we expect the cooperation that you agreed to when we signed on the dotted line. I don't think there's any issue with recru recruiting members right now so that they can get up to speed and understand all of these different pieces to it. It's difficult enough for us who are basically steeped in it but they can you know, there's nothing wrong with them learning all of this, reviewing all of this data, reviewing all this information, and keep the powder dry till that they're charged with the order to move forward on the sewer piece of this. The committee wouldn't do much until you got to the further down the road, you know. But I think they should True. be involved or yeah. the cursory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't, Just yeah. getting up to speed on all of this is important. It took a long time just to get up to speed on the contractual negotiations that have been going on for years on the water piece of it. And, and so getting a committee, a fully formed committee, or maybe some more interested participants than the three that we currently have, I think is a great idea now versus down the line from now. That's my perspective, but I know two of you don't agree with that, but the committee's already in place. It's, we don't even need to form it. We just need to invite, you know, potential stakeholders to throw their name in, fill out a form, and see if they want to be interested in joining that committee to help out with this, because it is going to be an all hands on deck when that time comes. And so why not let them get up to speed with everything, including the obstacles, including the silence or the other issues that you've had to face, you know? Because these boards change. Do lifetime appointment committees don't? Yeah. So, yeah. I don't well, know, Mike, we want to keep Bob Moss here, I yeah. think, for as long as we possibly exactly. can on this one. So he just has that institutional knowledge that's so... And Ms. Steve were there from the beginning. So helpful, yeah. So I don't know what you think, Mrs. Gonzalez, but... I, I absolutely agree with you and Mr. Schultz. I think that it's... There's no need to drag it. It should be formed now. Get it going. Why wait? Whatever you think they can offer to help, you know, that's what these committees are there for. Is that a, why wait? Yeah. Was that a rhetorical question? Or is it, it, I just think it's premature. And again, I'm not opposed to having uh, some committee to assist along the way, but I think um, the current group of people that are working, in consultation with this board, this board has some decisions <coughs> to make first. Mm -hmm. I think we need to make those decisions before we ask other people to devote hundreds and hundreds of hours while we spin our wheels and try and make some decisions. And again, in concert with Andover, I think the any uh, uh, assistance that we're going to be requesting of Andover should come from this board and the administration, not any other subcommittee or anybody else. I mean, it's it's us and the administration's relationship with, with the town of Andover that's going to facilitate things along with their consultants working with our consultants. So I think we need, it's a little bit premature. Uh, I just don't think we need to unnecessarily get people uh, to spend the time and effort and energy on a volunteer basis yet. And, uh, again, I think we've got a little ways to go before we need to start asking people to become truly engaged. Because we have a lot more work to do, and a lot more, and we have decisions to be made as a board until those decisions are made. You know, then we can bring, bring people up to speed because at least we'll know what our direction is going to be and how we're going to 
that we're going to be attacking uh, this project. So, again, I'm not opposed to it. I'm opposed to the timing of it right now. I think you're asking people, and again, we have a limited number of people who are willing to step forward, generally speaking, and what you're asking people to do is commit a significant amount of time, I think too soon. And as we move along and we have a plan, more people are going to understand which direction we're taking, how we're approaching it, and get more excited about it and get more involved. I see if anyone wants to step forward and volunteer, <coughs> by all means, fill out the form and come on forward. M Ms. Egan, I'm going to put you on the spot, but could you poll the <laughs> North Reading Chamber members to see if anybody would like to serve on such a committee? I'm happy to. Thank you. I can think of a few volunteers right now. All right. Okay, so did you have anything else you want? Thank you for the presentation and the explanation. And we do, we do, um, we know how much effort is being put into this by you and by our select board members and by our TA and everybody. And we appreciate it and we want you to keep going. And even if there's silence or slow moving, we need this. So thank you for the effort. Okay. Uh, Michael, would it be possible to put out a, um, an, e an email blast looking for volunteers for such a committee? I, I believe that we will be advertising soon for vacancies on select board. And we, we already have. We did. Did we do it last week? A um, couple weeks. <coughs> I about over three weeks ago. Okay. Yeah. Maybe we could put something out for this. And yeah. yeah. We I'd certainly be happy could to share advertise it on social media. Yeah. We could, we could definitely do a posting. We found that we've done, done that in the past. We've been able to get interest. Yeah. So, thank you. Does the board want to review the? I mean, does the board want to review the charge for the committee? I mean, it is there is a, a water component to the previous committee, and we may wish to update that charge um, before soliciting participants. Just from my reading of it quickly, I mean, it's a paragraph long, but some of it refers to water planning discussions that we've already had. Mm -hmm. So it, it maybe for a future agenda, we could look at that charge and just fine tune it. Mm -hmm. It'd be called a wastewater committee. Yeah, it maybe. So well, I, I think, think I would think the water planning process. I, I think so before we, advertising water planning water expansion process right now. So yeah. So can we review that before? I, I would advise that. I think yeah. we should just yeah. make sure that we're in agreement. Maybe next meeting we should. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. great. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions or comments or? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have to move on to our next order of business, which is uh, public hearing. So I'm just going to read the public hearing notice. The Town of North Reading Select Board Notice of Public Hearing Property Tax Classification Hearing. The Select Board will hold a public hearing on Monday, November 18, 2019 at 8 p.m. at North Reading Town Hall, 235 North Street, Room 14, to determine the percentage of the local tax levy to become borne by each class of real and personal property for fiscal year 2020 in accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40, Section 56. Interested taxpayers are encouraged to present oral testimony at this hearing or may submit information on their views in writing to the Select Board's office, either to the above address or via email at townadministrator at northreadingmass.gov no later than 12 o'clock noon on November 14, 2019, by the Select Board. <coughs> Madam Chair, before we get started, could, could I ask up front whether or not the, the Board of Assessors will be recommending a single tax rate or a split tax rate? At the current time, the Board met last week, and the Board of Assessors voted to maintain, our recommendation is to maintain a single tax rate. Thank you. In light of that, Madam Chair, I'll wait for the. Right. So, excuse me, Madam Chair. Uh, just as a uh, matter of disclosure, I have uh, family members who own uh, both residential and commercial real estate property, and as a result, uh, there may have been some limitation on my. Uh, ability to participate in the uh, discussion regarding a tax classification because of that. Um, but because the recommendation to the board will be for a single tax rate, it's my understanding that I am, am able to uh, participate uh, in the discussion, so therefore I will be. Thank you. 
Mr. Schultz. I, too, own commercial and residential property here in town, and for the same reasons articulated with Mr. O'Leary, I do not feel there's any conflict in me participating in this hearing. Actually, your situation is a little different. Why? Because you own both, yeah. there's no issue. Because I have a family member that owns both, and I don't own both. I only have residential. Yeah. It, based upon... That's crazy. It is... It, yeah. it, I did, I'm not trying to justify no. the explanation as to what's been given to me. Um, but because I have a family member that has residential and commercial property, and I do not, then it would pose potentially a potential conflict of interest. No. However, because the recommendation for the Board of Assessors is going to be for a single tax classification, there's no impact. And for the same reason, all five of us own houses in town. You could make that argument that we all own houses. We shouldn't argue about taxes. So no, I know. there'd be no one here to vote. But, 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 <laughs> but, but, but we've had other that members of the board, like yourself, that yeah. own commercial property and residential property, and it's been opined that right. there is no conflict right. there because you have both. Yeah. Because right. I only own residential, but I have a family member that owns both right. commercial and residential, there's a potential conflict. But since the recommendation is for single right. tax rate. Because we're voting on something that's going to have an overall effect on the general population, not us particularly as homeowners, but every homeowner, but could potentially, but for the, but for the advice. And, and again, it depends upon the percentage of interest that somebody has, and <laughs> it, it's really bizarre. But anyway, <laughs> nonetheless, thank yes, you. Yes, thank you for, for noting that, both of you. So on that note. <laughs> I know, we have our assessor here and our finance director here, and please proceed. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the state tax classification hearing for 2019. This is a state <coughs> mandated hearing uh, that must be held for fiscal year 2020. It's been a long day. Uh, this is a mandated hearing that must be held and I will be asking for votes uh, to be cast tonight. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Debbie Carboni, Assessing Manager. Uh, just a few updates that lead up to tonight's meeting, and one of them is the timely certification of our assessed valuation, as well as our new growth. Uh, we had full certification for October 8th, 2019. Our new growth was certified at a million seventy-seven two forty-four. With that being said, uh, we did have eleven new houses that were brought online this year. Our values for our new <coughs> for our overall residential for two thousand twenty is six zero one three thirty-four. That is our average residential home in the town. That is up from last year, 578,307. Our commercial is also, our commercial and industrial is also increased this year to a million average, a million 173,631. That is up from a million one ten nine thirty three. So from here we can uh, we can proceed with the hearing. The select board will be asked to cast three votes, to, four votes tonight. The minimum residential factor, an open space discount. A granting of a residential exemption, granting of a small commercial exemption. I will explain these in detail. The North Reading's levy profile today, the residential total, in other words, the residential class is born of 87.55% of our total levy. The commercial, industrial, and personal property make up the 12.45%. Anticipated and uncertified, we have uh, come up with a tax rate of $15.60. 
the FY19 tax rate was $15.60. As you can see on the bottom part of this slide. No, the FY19 tax rate was $15.58. 15, 15, 15. Isn't that what I said? No, no it was $15.60. Oh. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> So, as you can see, the levy has increased in 17, 18, 19. Our total tax levy for a fiscal year 2020 is 53213804 And I just want to note that that total tax <coughs> levy is the maximum um, levy allowed. So, you'll see in the vote that that is not what our levy is. Um, so I just want to note that in case you question why it's a different figure. That's a 2.5 figure? So this is the total maximum levy that's allowed, and then we're leaving some excess levy capacity on the table. Gotcha. So okay. that will, you'll see that in the votes. So. What is a split or dual tax rate? The communities decide to tax residential, commercial, industrial, and personal property, or CIP, differently. The statute allows an increase of the CIP share of the tax levy up to 50% higher than the residential. It does not generate new revenue. It reallocates the levy burden. The split tax rates, the town did try this in 1985 and 1988. I do not know what the outcome and or what their reason was back then. I just keep this on the slide year to year to show that we have done it in the past. When did they stop? Just for those two years, the fiscal year 1985 and the fiscal year 1988 were the only two years in which they tried or I, I would be guessing if I, it wasn't the levy that the CIP had a, a great percentage against the residential. If you look at our levy for all the years, we're always around 87%. I don't know. I was, would it only was, be it, guessing. It was, it was a political decision. It was not an economic oh. decision because there's no more revenue that comes into the exactly. town. Exactly. It was a political <laughs> decision on the part of the board at the time uh, to just, I think it was a 10% adjustment. Uh, and the following year, the outcry from the commercial property owners as to the significant increase that they paid uh, as a result of that vote it was reversed and it has remained the same since <laughs> so it was just a political decision and what happens is you'll see like the homeowner will save 50 bucks and the business owner will pay an extra two thousand or some correct absurd and, and, amount and, and, yeah. and, and again you know while the numbers were a little bit smaller than but exponentially percentage wise it was the same yeah. thing because i think the split was about the same it was probably around 10 or 11 percent i, uh, I commercial believe industrial. it was and you know now we're at 12.45 so, you know, the, the significance of the impact on the commercial and industrial properties in relation to the savings for the residential homeowner, it was insignificant to the residential homeowners and significant to the commercial industrial. Uh, so it was reversed the following year. My first year on the board. <laughs> <laughs> you reversed it. Thank you. Thank you for that expo. I'm just curious. I, that, I couldn't find part, anything for, in my office. For the most office, part, for these types of ratios, it is generally ends up being a political decision. Mm -hmm. um, but again, if you're looking to, uh, for fairness, and you're looking for uh, potential economic development and promotion of economic development, you hold off until that 12.45 gets up significantly more. Mm -hmm. you know, then it makes uh, a significant impact on the a mm -hmm. positive impact on the residential property owners as opposed to an insignificant impact. Um, I think it needs to be around 20% for it yeah, to make so sense. It's, yeah. Yeah, so we're not there yet. Sorry for that, but no, no. I was just curious no. about that. I don't think I ever noticed that on your slides before, and I didn't I realize the same thing. Yeah. 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 The next slide is just um, a breakdown of our single family homes. We have 4,278. 
Our residential condominium class, obviously that has gone up by 50 uh, condominiums this year with Pulte. The multifamily, those stay pretty much the same. Uh, those are all properties up to five units. So we have 46 of those. The mixed use properties, mixed use property is a business with an apartment or multiple. We have 27 of those. And the vacant land obviously will decrease because we're increasing our residential. So that's down uh, from 223 to 212 this year. Thanks. This will be the first slide that explains one of your votes tonight. The open space discount. The, we actually do not have any open space in the town of North Reading. Open space, as it is classified, is anything that is not taxed. We, if you think of a large tract of land or a farm or whatever, those have taxable valuations to them. Therefore, they do not qualify for the open space discount. So we still have to take this vote, but we do not have any properties that actually qualify. The residential exemption. This will be the second vote. The select board may adopt an exemption up to 20% shift in the residential class tax burden. What this does is it will reduce the tax burden from the lower assessed homes off to the higher assessed homes. It does not create more revenue. It does not change our levy. It literally will shift from the lower assessed homes to the higher. I do have a sheet in here that will explain that. Uh, here, if the select board was to choose a 10% exemption, the middle column is our average home value. And let's remember our value last year was 578 and change. We're we climb every year at 601. So what I did was I just reduced to the left by 100,000 on a lower assessed home, and then to the right is a million dollar home. This will show you the shift in the tax in how it works. Where it says savings and cost, the $782.08 will be removed from the lower assessed homes. <coughs> that same $782 will be shifted to the higher assessed homes. And the next two slides are if the select board chose a 15% exemption or 20% exemption. And I would like to explain this uh, residential exemption as well as a commercial exemption was really developed for the cities, Boston, Springfield, Holyoke. And it, it made sense there, but when it came down to classification and creating the guidelines on the process that select boards would have to go through, they are part of it. So the small commercial exemption works exactly the same way as the residential exemption. If you were to shift, you're going to shift it from your smaller commercial exemptions, the tax, onto the higher commercial properties. It is the exact same methodology. Did 
Does anyone have any questions? Well, that was quite clear. Thank you for that. I, I just have a, a quick question on, on the math. And again, not that we're going to do it, but on the scenario with the 10% exemption, you're saying if you shifted, you know, $100,000, you go from 601 assessed valuation to 501, the tax would go from $93,000, $9,400 down to $7,800. So, let me just get back to that. So that's $782.08, is that what you're talking about, Steve? Well, I'm just looking at, yeah, the $9,300, oh. this is what the tax bill would be, $9,380 and some change, so $9,400. You're saying if you reduced it, shift 10%, you know, shift it over a $100,000 difference, the tax would be $7,800. That's a $1,500 swing. So that 780 only represents 50%. I'm just looking at this number versus this number. The number should be double. But uh, again, not that we're going to do it, but I'm just looking yeah, at I know I put it on a calculator. I guess, can you just clarify what your question is? We're saying here a 10% shift, and you took $100,000 off, which is more than 10%. I no, mean. no, 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 no. She's just showing that the value, the lower class home values of, so she's going down $100,000, just as an example. Right. We could do it based upon $300,000 home, $400,000 home. So it, we're just taking the value, the 501334, and then you divide that by $1,000. And you, t you multiply that by 1560, and you come up with $7,820 of taxes that that home would pay if there was no exemption. And then we take off 10%, which is the 782, and it brings down the taxes to 7,038. So you have three classes of homes up there. Exactly. Yeah, okay. we're, showing, we're showing examples. Uh, I was thinking what you were thinking. Yeah, yeah, I, I, t I took it. Yeah. Okay. I took it the wrong way too. I took it as because the median is 601, anything under that is going to see the no. differential applied, and anything above the 601, it's going to see the differential added to. That's how I took that. that. That's correct. That is correct. That, that's how it is. Yeah. yeah. But we're just showing dollar amount examples. So yeah. you could have. It's, you not, know, it's not going to affect the middle parcel, although the, you carried the wrong amount down there, right? 9380 is going to stay 9380, not 9388. Oh, yeah. yeah. But, but yes, I, knew, I figured that was just a, <coughs> yeah. a type. It was a rush. Yeah. That's like house A, house B, and house C. Well, exactly. No, because you, you have to define the median. Is right. that right. 601 Which is the correct. average? Yeah. Exactly. Right. The average, mm -hmm. your average residential. Right. And I only provided the two. Just uh, Right. Ranges. It's, it's, it's on, all, all ranges. on that. So. You know, you know, the town administrator and the assessor and I were discussing earlier today, what if the house value was 602000 or 605000 How much, you know, do they bear? Well, they're only going to bear the, the small percentage increase. You know, it, it's the larger class of homes that, that bear the burden that come off of the lower class. So Which is why I did go to the million dollar property. What we I didn't know. understand about this is the dollar for dollar thing. That's the part I didn't understand. So you've got to make up that 782 somewhere. How did you just? The higher end homes take the burden off of the lower. They, they absorb the burden of the lower end homes. And it was, if you had like a $900,000 no. house, their know, burden would be a little bit less than yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah, that it wouldn't down. be the whole 78208. It would be yeah, know, 740 or whatever. Right. Well, that, yeah, that, that's why that, I think that. But at the end of the day. Total, it's just an example, in it, other words. Total taxes at the end of the day collected to a tax guy here. is the same right. whether we have no shift or we have a 10% shift or a 15 or a 25% shift. We still collect the same amount of taxes, and you'll see that on right. one of our final slides. Does that do you? Uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I asked. Exactly. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Exactly. Olympics at numbers. Guys, I'm sorry. So I'm sorry. I'm good. Not making, not, it's not a, I made the same mistake. <laughs> so the last vote that will be asked of you tonight is a select board may shift the town's tax burden from the residential class to the commercial, industrial, and personal property classes. 
as long as the shift does not exceed the minimum residential factor. North Reading's minimum residential factor is the 87.55. Uh, this means that no more than 12.45% of the residential class can be shifted off to the CIP or the following page will contain the information on the impact if any shift is chosen. The Board of Assessors did meet uh, last Thursday and as, as the numbers fall right now, uh, the Board of Assessors, and it's only a recommendation, it's, it's not our vote, um, is to maintain a, a single tax rate. This is a pie chart just to show the um, percentages. Uh, the personal property is in purple. The industrial is in green. And the commercial is the brown. And the residential is the yellow. Some may disagree with the colors. So this is an example of shifting the rate. And again, what we're going to look at is on the left-hand side, I've broken this down by classes. The residential with the percentage. And then if you follow the chart across, the 100% in the taxes paid if, if you were to maintain a single tax rate. The next column with the rate, if you were to increase it by 10%, I didn't do like 1.15. I just did it in the common increments. So, and then the taxes that would be paid for the residential with the 10% shift. 1.25, those taxes, and 1.5. So as you can see, it, it does change the tax rate on the residential. If you follow that down to the commercial, industrial, and personal property, it is going to increase the tax rate for those classes. And again, this does not change our tax. We are still going to collect the same amount of tax. But the shift in the, in the taxes is shifted off to the CIP and remove from the residential. Any questions? Members have any questions? Mr. Schultz? I, thank you very much for you guys, both of you guys for your presentation and I would submit we keep things as a status quo. I, one of the concerns that I have I'm getting from people in those middle to upper homes, not maybe the million dollar houses, but that six to eight hundred thousand dollar houses, as soon as their kids are leaving high school, they're leaving the town. And if we want to protect seniors, just because a senior lives in a middle to upper home doesn't mean we shouldn't protect them as much as we protect the senior living in a small end home. So I'm not in favor of the shifting of taxing. I would keep things directly as is so we can let people retire and stay in their homes. We're getting way too many people in that 55 to 65 range that are fleeing town, you know, this is my opinion. And what's going to happen is you're going to replace that person with somebody with kids and you're going to have expenses on the schools. So Your infrastructure in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other members have any comment? Shall we take some motions? <coughs> Madam Chair, I move to establish a tax classification factor of 1.0 as recommended by the Board of Assessors. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Oh. Close the hearing. Sorry. Hold on to that motion. Is anyone here to speak about this matter? Lisa? That's part of the Say public words. hearing. I'm sorry. I forgot about this. Well, that's a part. You're the only person that could possibly speak on it. Do I stand up? Sure. I'm anyone? sorry. Just I should have invited anyone that's oh, yeah. in attendance. Oh, Maureen, if you want to speak about it too. 
Just, <laughs> just what you'd have to write. Comments other than what you're We're looking for speakers. <laughs> Please. That's right. Thank you. You could identify yourself. Sure. You I'm Lisa okay. Egan. I'm at 8 Oak Ridge Road in Reading, and I'm the director of the Chamber of Commerce in Reading, North Reading. And I just wanted to say thank you for the excellent presentation, and I'm happy to hear the board is planning on maintaining the single tax rate. I know there's a lot of good things coming with North Reading. Um, with the new Economic Development Committee and the business community workshop that happened just last month at Kitties. So I think a single tax rate is definitely an asset and something you can really use to your advantage and even ex exploit because none of the other neighboring communities north of Boston um, within, you know, 10, 15 miles have a single tax rate. So it's definitely an advantage and I'm glad the board is um, hopefully planning on maintaining it because I, it's very supportive to the business community and you know whether we'd like it or not it doesn't raise any additional money for the town it really just shifts the tax burden so I think it's confusing um, it took a long time for me to understand that yep we can't have the huge companies <coughs> paying more it's just not feasible so I think it's wonderful and thank you on behalf of all the businesses for um, keeping this business friendly single tax rate Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And is there anyone yeah. else? A question just for Lisa. Oh. Did, uh, did our friends from the south uh, in Reading deal with this issue just recently? Yes. yes. Reading created a, a small, first they did a very minor tax rate really to um, protect seniors to that point that you mentioned yeah. earlier, where it wasn't a true split, but it was, there was a tiny tweak for parity, so like, the small percentage. It was of like 1.02, I believe. Yeah, it was something very, ago. very small, yeah. exactly. That was a few years ago. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then last year, they did split it to, I believe, and I would, I don't want to misspeak. Um, it's a little later in the day, so I, I can't remember exactly, but they did split it a little bit more, I want to say, to 1.1. 1 .1. Um, but they did not change it at their annual tax classification. They didn't split it further, but yes, they do officially have a split tax rate. Um, so. Thank you. Can I help with any other questions? Tell people that are taxed too high. We're open for business here. <laughs> We're open for business, Fair business enough. friendly. Mm -hmm. It's a great thing, and it's very supportive. So we appreciate it. Okay, thank Thanks. you. Anyone else that wants to come forward, uh, hearing none, seeing none, <laughs> I will close that portion. And we have a motion on the floor. And we had a second by Mr. Schultz. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Madam Chair, I move not to establish a residential exemption. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Schultz. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Madam Chair, I move not to establish a commercial exemption. I have a second. mo I have a motion. I have a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? That was Andy. That was Andy. Mr. Schultz, yes. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Madam Chair, I move to recommend the FY 2020 property tax levy at 53 193751.26, which is 20,052.74 less than the levy limit. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Schultz. And oh, I got it, I got it. Yeah. Any further discussion? Mr. Schultz. Real quick, for you two guys here before us tonight, thank you for not going right to the levy. I mean, every savings is helpful, mm -hmm. and that's great for the taxpayer. But again, once again, we're not taxing to the max. Yeah. <laughs> that's another truck we can buy now. <laughs> okay. Um, and we have a motion and a second, and any <laughs> further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. <clears throat> Thank you. We have one more, right? One more. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I move to recommend to the Board of Assessors that the FY 2020 tax rate be set at 15.60 per 1,000 of valuation. Okay. Second. I have a motion. I have a second by Mr. Schultz. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. I would, before I leave, I do want to remind you that um, the Department of Revenue has changed their policy for signing the LA-5 
So you are um, going to have to log into Gateway and just sign for um, your accounts. Yeah. When, when Usually I walk around. around. When will that option be available to the board members? <laughs> what two weeks? As soon as tomorrow. Okay. Will you send that so to So that us? doesn't get sent like an email? That's something you we have, have to, to do? Have to go in and log in. Maybe we, we can facilitate through the office if that would be Thank helpful you. for yeah. folks. To stop by and do it rather than have to. That's great. Thank you. Technology wants select board zero. So <laughs> <laughs> we know where we stand. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our next order of business is the <coughs> approve the legal bills. Madam Chair, I move to approve legal bills for October 2019 in the amount of. Sixteen thousand four seventy one ninety two as follows Copeman and Page five thousand three fifty ninety two Copeman and Page Labor seven thousand five seventy two twenty Elm Street forty B project three thousand five forty nine total of sixteen thousand four seventy one ninety two. Second. I have a motion and a second by Mr. Schultz. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Next order of business, is that, that it's it for legal bills. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Gilberto, town administrator's report. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do have a few matters to update the board on in my report and then a couple of things that have come up since the report was published. I'll go through them in order. First, I attached a flyer describing the work of the Open Space and Recreation Committee, which I know Select Board Member Gonzalez brought up earlier tonight. Um, there is a survey that will be in the next round of water bills that will be coming to people's homes and there is a public meeting scheduled for December 5th from 6.30 to 8.30 here at Town Hall. Survey is also available online I believe as well mm -hmm. through the website. Uh, as a reminder, fall curbside yard waste collection will occur on Saturdays, November 23rd and December 14th. So the first one will be this coming Saturday. We have a flyer that's out there. Um, the DPW yard continues to be open Saturdays from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. and then on Sundays from 12 noon to 4 p.m. Um, if you're going to have, uh, if you're going to leave things to be collected curbside, we ask that it be outside by 6:30 a.m. on Saturday morning. Uh, the town clerk and I have reviewed the calendar for 2020 and are recommend recommending the following dates for town meeting: Monday, June 8th, and Monday, October 5th. We'll be reviewing this with the financial planning team at their next meeting, and it would come back to the board to ultimately formally approve the dates at a hearing in January pursuant to the select board's, um, uh, to the town uh, charter. Um, the June 8th, the Monday, June 8th, is the second Monday of the month, uh, which is what we did on this current calendar year in 2019. Um, and the Monday, October 5th, is the first available Monday um, that's followed by the um, state and federal holiday of Columbus Day on October 12th. Um, so we figured that that would make the most sense as well. But I just want to put that out there if there's any sort of strong objection to that to start the conversation now. Otherwise, it will come to the board for a formal vote at the, um, at the January town meeting. And just to remind folks, the reason we, we were looking to that second Monday in June rather than the first Monday was to accommodate the use of the middle and high school complex that first week in June when it tends to be very busy, um, including not only for the um, for the um, Grand March associated with the senior prom, but for some of the other awards and other events that are going on that week. Uh, Fire Chief Don Statz is recommending a change in the compensation of the call non-union firefighters to streamline the accounting and to increase the rate to be more comparable to surrounding communities. We intend to implement this change effective January 1st, 2020. The chief put a memorandum that I attached to my report which describes the nature of the rates, which is a, uh, to consolidate them. Um, it will result in an increase in the rates, um, but will also consolidate the application of the rate structure. And the chief believes that he is able to absorb that increase um, through the um, fiscal year 20 uh, budget. Um, if not, we do have available to us the option of the, uh, the salary pool as well. So traditionally what's happened with these rates is they've been adjusted in accordance with the, um, the negotiated union contract for our firefighters has been a couple of years since the structure itself was looked at so that's why he's come forward with this and I know he's been in a lengthy discussion with the um, members of the call department relative to some of the concerns they've highlighted for more than a year so we're, we're, we're pleased to finally have something here um, to, to move forward with effective January 1st 
2020. What's the, Madam Chair, what's the current size of our total force at this point, and are we anticipating to grow? So it, it is relatively small um, with, um, with five uh, active members at this point in time. Um, we had one recent departure from the, um, the call department, um, bringing us to the five um, with uh, varying degrees of availability. Um, there isn't a plan to grow the call department at this point in time while we're um, looking at the overall uh, structure for, um, for staffing, um, but it does remain an option available to us, um, both for the short or long term, if we decided that that was the best action for us to take. Um, so it, it, it's sort of in the mode of preserving the call department at its current staffing level and recognizing the efforts of the five um, individuals who are participating in that program uh, when they're able to. Bear with me one moment. Um, also, um, with regard to the fire department, Chief Stats uh, is uh, also intending to rent condition garage space at 217 Main Street, which was recently sold to Pine Ridge Technologies due to space constraints at the fire station. Um, and I attached a memorandum from the fire chief as well. So some of the board members remember 217 Main Street was a property that we were looking at acquiring for uh, potential uh, public use, including potentially for the fire department, um, almost exactly a year ago. And one of the hurdles that we ran into was that it, the building is not rated from a construction standpoint to serve as a fire department. And it would not be serving as a fire department in this use. It would be serving as conditioned garage space. So the apparatus would not be responding from this location as they would have been under the, the, um, the scenario we were discussing a year ago. It would instead be garaged at this point, this, uh, this location as uh, a, a, an extra apparatus. And what the intention would be is if apparatus that was in service needed to come out of service, there would be an ability to trade that apparatus and move this from the location of 217 Main Street to where the staff will remain at the fire department um, on Park Street. Um, and this is a result of the uh, e expanding size of the apparatus as we go through and replace them. So the most recent example of a fire engine that we identified, we historically recently have gone with Schmiel as a manufacturer for um, apparatus. And in order to to do that, we would have had to have gone with a 32-foot 30, fire engine being ordered. And the chief felt that that was just simply going to be, it was going to create things in an already tight situation to be even tighter. So uh, working with, a, with the committee of the department, they settled on an engine from a manufacturer known as KME. During the course of the design, they identified that what was expected to be a 31-foot uh, engine ended up coming in at a 31-foot 3-inch engine and there was no way to reduce it further, and there was no smaller option available. It fits into the uh, facility, but it's creating um, a bit of a challenge moving around on the apparatus floor and exacerbating what was already a challenging situation. So the chiefs identified um, that this could be an alternative for us to use to park um, the, uh, the, the sort of non-frontline apparatus, one, you know, one engine, while we look to potentially make up the difference on that on the next piece of apparatus that's purchased and also obviously conduct the ongoing facilities master plan effort that the facilities master plan advisory committee is working on um, uh, on a parallel course. Um, we finished about that? Almost. Okay, sorry. So I'll just note that, um, that the, our, our understanding is that the rental would be for $350 uh, per month, and that would be on a, a, be a short-term agreement between now and the end of the fiscal year. And we would be looking to the structure of a longer-term agreement that would be accounted for in this fiscal year 2021 budget request. I'm confused about that because although there was nothing wrong with the structural integrity of the building, mm -hmm. it was inappropriate for structurally for fire apparatus because it required significant building code upgrades to store. It had nothing to do with the, that I didn't recall it having anything to do with responding to an emergency scene. I thought it had to be, there would have to be specific upgrades according to the fire codes. For, for it to serve as an active fire station, there would be. Um, for it to serve for purposes of garaging our vehicle, 
Um, the building, the, the fire chief has consulted with the building inspector, and we've also consulted with our insurance companies as well. And the use okay. that we're contemplating, which is basically to park the vehicle in a conditioned space, um, it, it would be a suitable location for it, but it would not be suitable to serve as a, as a place housing individuals on a 24-hour basis responding oh. from a fire station. So okay. mm -hmm. it's a bit of a nuance, but it's an important nuance that, that makes this uh, option available to us, again, as a, a, an interim solution for, uh, for parking, parking the vehicles. Are there any further questions? I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Okay. Do you have any more? More information? Yes, <laughs> I, I do, unfortunately. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know it. Um, I, I did tell the board that uh, we were looking at the response level for plow contractors, I think it was a week or so ago, um, and that we were concerned that there had been a lower than anticipated uh, response this fall. We did kind of put the push out to try to see if we could get some more interest and um, you know, there's been a concerted effort to try to attract contractors over the past week. Um, st still haven't quite gotten the response at the level that we're looking for. So um, I, we are seriously considering making another change to the, uh, the, the payment schedule for contractors. You may recall last year, so the three years ago, we increased the rates overall. Last year, we sort of came up with a hybrid solution, which was to create an early incentive. So people who uh, signed up basically by, I believe, mid-October would be rewarded with a higher rate, but that is not proven to get us to, to where we wanted to be in terms of a staffing standpoint. And it's really a reflection of the economy. Um, the construction season um, it has really attracted quite a bit of uh, the traditional contractor into, into construction, and the season's getting longer as there's more demand for construction, so firms are looking to, to build later into the year. Um, and we've also got the issue of competition. Um, and communities nearby are escalating their rates. One community in, with their rates, one community in particular, implemented a significant increase, um, which uh, drew quite a bit of uh, attention from a contractor standpoint. Um, so I just kind of making the board aware that, you know, we've been monitoring this, but it, it is looking like we're going to need to make an increase in the, in the rates. And that's something that we established through uh, direct contract with contractors. It's not something that requires a, a board vote, but we try to be upfront with the board to let the board know because it does have an impact on the overall cost for snow removal here in town. Um, Cost and also ability to respond to sure. situations. So. So, so we want to be, you know, we want to have readily available 30 or so contractors to to respond to supplement the, uh, I believe it's 18 pieces of town-owned equipment that we have to go out there, and and that's what allows us to be able to to deliver snow removal services or snow plowing services at the level the community expects, and we, you know we certainly want to make sure we're able to continue that. Um, so I just sort of make the board aware of that. Um, a couple of other issues that uh, I, w I would just note. Um, I know there's been some discussion relative to the, uh, the, the water supply and the issue of uh, PFAS, and we didn't have time to get into a presentation by the water superintendent earlier this evening, but I, I would, you know, just for folks who don't know, um, there was a permit that was renewed for the Lowell Wastewater <coughs> Utility to accept runoff containing chemicals known as PFAS from a landfill in New Hampshire. Um, within a day of the permit, being renewed and it becoming public, the utility uh, announced it was suspending accepting the runoff, so that's a little wastewater utility um, that will no longer be accepting the runoff. We just wanted to let the board and the community know, um, and I know we've spoken with the transcript as well, that uh, our DP, DPW has been in contact with the town of Andover, which is running its own uh, test of uh, water with regard to the, the PFAS to determine the PFAS levels that may or may not be there. Um, they, uh, they're expecting that their results will be available soon. Um, I believe we were hoping to see something last week, but I haven't seen anything as of yet. We're also simil similarly testing our wells. Those tests went out on, I believe, Wednesday of last week, and there's a, about a two-week turnaround on that. Um, I, should, uh, I should note that we did test in 2014, uh, and those tests did not detect any level of PFAS. It was non-detectable. Um, it's possible that advances in testing capabilities could identify a very low presence of PFAS in either or both communities. Uh, it's been you know, five years the technology has, uh, has changed. Um, but, you know, we just want to let the community know, because we know there was a lot of concern when this publicity came out, you know, that we, are, we have been monitoring it, we have been in touch with the town of Andover, and we are, in fact, testing our own water uh, from the wells as well um, as, a, as a precaution at this point. This is an unregulated... Um, contaminant in the water supply, but it's in the process of becoming a, a regulated contaminant as we understand it, so it'll eventually fall into that category, but nonetheless we felt the responsibility of doing, of needing to do that testing. 
I also would just welcome two new employees um, to uh, the town of North Reading. The first is Nicholas Amaralt, who was sworn in as a patrol officer this morning. Um, Nicholas is a graduate of Bishop, Bishop Hamrick High School who went on to receive a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. Um, Nick graduated from the Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority Police Academy in 2018, and he's currently a military police officer with the U.S. <coughs> Army Reserve. Again, he was sworn in this morning and will be in recruit uh, training um, for um, the foreseeable future. Uh, Stephanie Conley, the administra newest administrative assistant to the Board of Health, which is a graduate of Methuen High School who went on to receive a bachelor's degree from Salem State University. She has both private sector and municipal experience and is looking forward to uh, her uh, career here at the Town Hall. Again, she'll be the administrative assistant for the Board of Health, which sort of completes um, the, uh, the staffing changes that have happened in that particular area of the building, um, um, which uh, have been ongoing for the past four or five months. So we're pleased to welcome um, Stephanie on board here and then a um, couple of other quick things uh, Susan Magner who was recognized as a veteran service officer of the year she was actually recognized by care dimensions uh, at a luncheon last week for her contributions to the community I was able to be there with her and so I congratulate her for um, for that that work um, I, I would also note that I was contacted by the Northeast Metropolitan Regional Vocational School District they are looking to add some programming um, in the uh, design of the potential uh, new building that they will construct, including a marketing program, a biotechnology program, and a medical assistance program. So they invited me to a meeting on uh, Thursday evening, which uh, after some adjusting of my schedule was able to attend. Um, I think um, some useful information that was provided, but uh, I think that there's also um, you know, some continued discussion we'll need to have with them regarding the programs and, and the, the, the scope of the um, the offerings at the school so they've offered to come and continue the conversation because we sort of ran out of time that evening and um, I'll be including the superintendent and the assistant superintendent in those discussions that concludes my comments this evening I know that was long thank you that very it? much yeah that's it <laughs> nine items later any questions Mr. Just a quick question back on the on the water I mean it was almost like a perfect storm there a week or so ago mm. we had um, the notification that was mailed out because in, I believe it was just a more of an administrative uh, error in not notifying the state of the, um, the findings and therefore we were required to do the mailing that we did. Mm -hmm. Simultaneously we had, Reading had a boil order. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then we had this PFAS issue uh, hit the headlines too. Correct. So I, I think it's important for the public to, to understand three very separate and distinct issues, none related to the other. Correct. Uh, but the t other than the timing of it all. That's correct. And that it's fine to drink the water. <laughs> it it, it, it is. Why don't you just expand upon, you know, sure, the, the there, timing, what happened, and then. There, there were three things that happened in close proximity. And, you know, the first, we we're in the situation of issuing a mailing in October for a testing issue that occurred in August, um, for which we knew, you know, within 24 hours of uh, the testing, the initial testing, that there, in fact, wasn't a problem in the water. But because of the, the regulations we're required to do testing, um, you know, we, we, we did the assessment that was required. In fact, we did express um, our, our efforts and, and the issue to the agencies involved, but they were not expressed to them in the proper fashion. So that resulted in a need to, um, to do the mailing. So we did that mailing, and uh, I believe it should have hit most folks home um, on or about October 29th or 30th. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, in hindsight, I think uh, we could have done a better job communicating that that mailing was coming out to people before it came out so that people would have been aware when it hit their mailboxes what it was and why it was coming because it was a, it was a bit of a, a, a I think, um, strongly worded, but unfortunately we're working off of State Department of Environmental Protection templates. So as much as we wanted to offer further explanation, we were a bit limited as to what we could actually say to explain it. You know, that caused a need for dual communication. So that happened in that, that um, last week of October. Then the weekend immediately following it, Andover had its issue. And again, there is no interconnection between the two systems. Our pipes are not connected. Um, yeah, they, they are receiving water from the MWRA. Reading, not Andover. Reading, excuse me. Thank you. <laughs> not Andover, Reading. Um, <clears throat> Reading is connected to the MWRA. And as far as you know, we've seen, I don't believe it was an MWRA Co-op and Reservoir issue, but more of a local issue within the town of Reading. Which fortunately, through some you know testing and retesting, they were able to resolve and get their water supply back up and running that Monday. Um, and then, I think two days after that, this whole thing about PFAS 
um, you know, came up being, you know, a, I, I don't, we're certainly not unaware of the issue of PFAS and, and, the, and the, the, the potential threat that it can be to the water supply, obviously by, by virtue of the fact that we did this testing in 2014. I think we weren't necessarily aware that this permit was out there and, and, and that, that it was going to potentially be, um, be reissued, which it was that Tuesday. But to summarize, our water has and continues to meet the state and federal drinking water standards. Um, you know, as I've you know, mentioned to folks whenever they've asked me around town, you know, we're, we're monitoring the water supply every day, Saturday, Sunday, holidays. Um, there's a, you know, somebody on duty who's going, going to the facilities, checking the facilities out, testing multiple times over the course of any potential, particular month um, to keep an eye on things. And um, we're going to continue to do that to preserve the, the integrity of the system. Just two things, Michael. Would it be possible to put a little something in the next water bill showing exactly how we test on a regular basis? Just let the public know. It is, yes. I, I can't guarantee it'll be the next water bill because I believe the Open Space and Recreation Committee got in front of us with the, uh, the mailing, but perhaps a subsequent and one. Another thing for the public there's a great Facebook site, it's the Merrimack River Watershed Council. I belong to it and they'll send you a ping whenever there's a sewage event in the Merrimack. It's a really good group. Yeah. You can sign up Excellent. for that. Thank a lot you. of good info. Yeah, absolutely. And just a, one other thing is that uh, we want to ensure that our major supplier, which is Andover, notifies us on a timely basis. Mm -hmm. Not that they haven't, but I think they could do it on a more timely basis so that uh, you know, if they were aware of this PFAS issue, mm -hmm. um, maybe we should have been notified by them you know, sooner. And additionally, if there are any other um, means by which we can get notification as far as discharges into the Merrimack. Yeah. That site get is us, great uh, for get that. Ourselves, you know, get ourselves uh, situated so that we don't have to rely on Andover necessarily, but again, Andover should uh, have us in the queue like any other uh, customer up there, I suppose. And that site is great for that. Again, just for the public, it's, let me look it up here. It's the Merrimack River Watershed Council, and they will post whenever there's an, an outflow. They put it right on there and I get an alert. So it's. But I just think. But we should be hearing it from Andover too. Yeah. yeah but uh, but you know, and again, Andover has a great system in place, uh, good uh, filtration plant and uh, mechanism to buffer from directly from the river, Haggard's Pond, and then uh, treatment. So it's fairly well insulated and it's a good system. But again, there's, there needs to be a comfort level uh, and an awareness. Or there already there already is an awareness. Uh, there just needs to be a comfort level, or if the concern needs to be raised, we should hear it. Uh, on a timely basis, that's all. So Absolutely. to communicate that with, uh, with them, we'd appreciate it. I know the DPW director has spoken with their DPW director, but I'm happy to convey that to the town manager as well. Any other questions? <clears throat> Old and new business, Mr. O'Leary. Just uh, one thing. It uh, retailers in North Reading were notified of a public hearing taking place Thursday, I believe. Monday or Thursday? Monday Thursday. the 21st? Uh, but anyway, the Board of Health is going to have a uh, public hearing on uh, vape products and potential uh, limitation on the sale of vape products to certain types of businesses as opposed to what currently is available. Uh, a couple of points. And, 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 you know, the, the public health issue is is real and it's there. Um, a, a lot of it is um, a direct result of black market products rather than the, the products that are being sold in the retail establishments here. Uh, but what's being proposed here um, is would have a direct impact on availability, certainly. But who could sell it? I mean, the types of establishments that are being proposed here, we don't even have any of this down in Arthritic. And we're looking to limit uh, the convenience stores, uh, the ability to compete with other convenience stores, convenience stores in other communities, and uh, sell products that are relatively heavily regulated. And again, it's a matter of choice for people, whether it be these vape products, other tobacco products, cigarettes, cigars, you know, pipe tobacco, chewing tobacco. Um, of which I don't partake of, but you know, some people do, um, to the detriment of their health. But my concern is, I don't want to get caught in, in, in a knee-jerk reaction here when the state has taken some, you know, the governor has taken some action, uh, which is 
being adjudicated now. The legislature is considering some action. Uh, the federal government is considering some action. Uh, and I think what's being proposed here, maybe we should be of con concern that we're placing our current businesses at a disadvantage uh, for legit selling legitimate controlled products. You know, age is one thing, but just banning it outright. Um, and again, I'm not advocating buying it or using it, but my concern is I'm not necessarily, and again, I generally advocate, you know, think local, act, you know, or think global, act local, but at times, you know, we just have to be cautious that we're not just having a knee-jerk reaction and that, you know, the appropriate bodies to deal with these types of issues and products, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily right here to the detriment of local businesses when they can go a mile down the road or a mile up the road and get the same products. So I, I don't know if you're aware of, of what's being proposed. And does the administration have a position? Because we haven't been asked to, to weigh in. So I'm aware that there are regulations proposed. Uh, I have not weighed in with a position on it one way or the other. It's been something that's been handled by the Board of Health. They do have a hearing scheduled for Thursday evening. However, in my conversations with the health director uh, as of today, um, you know, some pending legislation at the state level, the board may opt not to proceed with these regulations because of what they believe is going to be some action at the state level. So the, the last I heard as of 2.30 this afternoon was that there was a likelihood based on the state action that, that, that this actually, this hearing may not may not occur or that action may not occur on these regulations. That's the last that I heard on okay. it. That's all. I just think, and again, something like this, if it's going to happen, um, and I know there was a public notice in the transcript and there was a mailing to retailers, um, but I found out, found out walking into the convenience store, I didn't notice the, the, the public notice, shame on me. Um, but the retailer said, you know, there's going to be a fight on Saturday or whatever it is. And uh, I said, what are you talking about? You know, and they showed me the letter, and I go, I wasn't aware. Mm -hmm. And I think um, the board should be aware. Uh, not that yeah. it's our call, you know, because it's not. You know, it's the board of Health can put in the regulations. But I think we should be aware of uh, promulgating new regulations of any significant magnitude. We should be made aware of it beforehand and not necessarily have to rely on reading the public notice, a little public notice ad in the, in the transcript while walking into a convenience store. First I heard of it. And have yeah. someone too. say, yeah. hey, Mr. O'Leary, you see what's going on here? Mm. I said, no, I didn't know. I wasn't aware. And, and this is significant. And, and again, it, it, believe me, I, I, I think the public should be uh, protected uh, from products such as this. Um, but I think it should be more broad-based than just the town of North Reading uh, taking action unil unilaterally. You know, without a little bit more, you know, discussion or awareness, at least on a, on our part, and then uh, coming to fruition. So again, I get it. Well, I'm not necessarily trying to uh, to influence the board of health. And they're one of your appointees, they're not our appointees. Um, decision making process, but I think communication is important, and I think uh, you know, more awareness as to what's going to happen and when it's going to happen, and I don't know if any other members of the board are aware of this at all. For suburban. You know, so, uh, again, first I heard it was about quarter or six this evening. I know <laughs> Cools and Newports are being banned now, right? Yeah. Menthol cigarettes? Uh, menthol Menthols. cigarettes, you know. Hmm. So, uh, again, there's a whole host of products that are bad for us, you know, and, uh, and we should know better than to use them, but they're still legal. And, um, you know, it, I, I get a little bit concerned, you know, when we single out some of our business people here and harm them economically when they can just travel south of the border and north of the town border and same regulations out there. It's important for the state legislators and the state legislature to, to take appropriate action statewide so that everybody's impacted the same, the same thing at the federal, federal level. So um, I just didn't Plastic know bags. if you were aware or anyone else was aware. I guess that's my concern is, yeah. you know, the potential implementation of something. Um, Does the board wish to have a, a position expressed to the board of health with regard to it? I mean, I, 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 I don't have a personal. I don't, I don't even know if I have enough information. 
you know, to, to, to express an opinion. I think they got to have their hearing. We'll just find out what they have to say at their hearing. But, uh, I have no idea what they're going to say. You know, they may not. Are they making a decision? It, it, it's very that? likely that the federal, there'll be federal regulations on it because it wasn't just the. Well, we can't get from what I'm that. from what I'm reading, it wasn't just the the dank that under the black market sales. It's also an additive acetate additive yeah. in the regularly marketed. But I don't know. I'm not a medical physician, <laughs> but I, it it seems to be that. It seems to be an issue with that chemical. It seems like it'll be the subject of federal regulation. Maybe that's why they're, you know, maybe they're trying to get ahead of that and get ready for that and meet with the meet with the store owners to see the impact of that on them. But I, I don't know that we would need to state a position to the Board of Health to. I don't think it'd be appropriate for us to do that either. To whether or not or how we feel about what they're doing without I mean, all, all the information. I mean, I'd be happy to, to join with the, the, the Board of Health to urge our legislators to address the issue at the state level so it impacts everybody across the board the same. Um, and then in the absence of lack of action at the, at the state level, you know, then fine. Maybe then it comes back to the local level to, to start, you know, handling things. And same thing at the federal level. My expectations for the federal level to get anything enacted these days is pretty low. So <laughs> They're busy with their circus right now. So. You know, so it's, uh, All right. Ms. Yeah. Gonzalez, <laughs> Ms. Gonzalez has her hand up. Did I hear you correctly? It sounded like it was more than just vape. You said something about <laughs> chewing tobacco, change, cigar. The, the proposed changes uh, to the North Carolina Board of Health tobacco control regulations include but are not limited to the following. One, prohibit the sale of all vape products, including but not limited to e-cigarettes, vape juices, vape cartridges, mm -hmm. and vape pods in all establishments except in adult-only retail tobacco stores, RI, vape, and smoke shops, that do not sell products that require retail food permit. So in other words, it's basically targeting convenience stores, they've, like pretty well, much. And they've I mean, already put the vape right, places where out of entry business. Entry by so. persons under the age of 21 is always prohibited, and where the primary purpose of the business is to sell tobacco and or vape products, especially you know, tobacco stores only can, will be authorized to do it. Number two, reduce from 18 to 16 the total number of tobacco, tobacco vaping product sale permits that can be issued in the town of North Reading. Three, cap the total number of adult-only retail tobacco stores, i.e. vape and smoke shops and North Reading at three stores, and require that no new store can sell tobacco or vape products within 500 feet of an existing store that sells tobacco and or vape products. And five, require that adult-only retail tobacco stores, i.e. vape and smoke shops, post a sign warning about the dangers of vape use and providing resources to help purchasers quit the use of vape products. Yeah, I, I applaud the effort and what they're trying to do. Um, but I don't hear of any other communities around us that are looking to do it. I would rely, personally rely upon the state legislature to address the issue and the federal level also. If the federal doesn't, the state <coughs> is in a far better position right now to uh, analyze the whole situation and, and promulgate some rules and regulations across the board uh, for the public good. So again, at quarter six, Someone said, hey, are you aware? I'm not. I wasn't. So I was surprised. I just uh, would hope that within town hall, communication could be communicated better to the board and uh, other appropriate public officials uh, to raise awareness as to what we're thinking about doing. Okay. You know, whether or not it's their intent to vote on it post haste or just get the input. I, I don't know. Like I said, I, I bought my Coca-Cola and got it and came here, so I hadn't had the chance to talk to anybody on the Board of Health or, or the health agent either. I, I, don't know, I don't know who suggested this either. I don't know if it came from the Board of Health or if it came from the health agent. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not sure either. Okay. So, so I just figured I'd make everybody aware and uh, concern on the communication level and concern, certainly concern from a health uh, standpoint for the products and what's happening out there and again uh, you know, good for the governor for trying to do what he was doing I don't necessarily agree with the methodology that yeah. they went about it but uh, his intent was good and you know and we'll get some judicial opinion as to the legality of it but um, again it forces the discussion and it forces some action on the legislature's part I hope
that's all. All right. Mr. Walner? I'm good. Thank Mr. You. Schultz? I'm good. Ms. Gonzalez? I'm good. <laughs> all right. Okay. I'm good, too. Motion to go back into the executive session. Let's see. Yes. Motion to reconvene in executive session for purposes of exemption two to conduct strategy session in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or contract negotiations with non-union personnel. And exemption six to consider the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property if the chair declares that an open meeting may have a detriment effect on the negotiating position of the town which I do I so declare and following executive session the board will reconvene in open session for adjournment purposes only second I have a motion and a second mr. O any discussion mr. O'Leary hi Mr. Walner mr. Schultz Ms. Gonzalez aye. Aye. 